Hi, my name is Scott Phillips. I'm the president and founder of Starfish Medical. Occasionally we do special expertise videos, and this one is about regulatory affairs. We're going to be talking about the 1345-2016 edition and how we rolled that in. We'll also be talking about our experience with FDA pre-sub meetings and some tips about how you should uh, approach those. I think you're really going to enjoy the video. Thanks. Hi, my name is Vesna Janik. Uh, I'm Director of Quality and Regulatory Department at Starfish Medical. Today I'm going to be talking about our transition to ISO 1345-2016. My colleague Virginia Anastasova is going to be talking about some learnings from the FDA pre-submissions. As you are aware, the ISO 1345-2016 is coming into effect by March 1st, 2019. So if your company has not done anything yet, now is the time to start really panicking because you don't have too much time and it's not just you, it's the registers themselves. Um, registers are getting too many requests, they don't have enough people and the deadline is coming and everybody was kind of procrastinating and postponing uh, to get uh, audits in place. So I am strongly advising you, get your act together, contact the register, book your audit and then start preparing for the audit if you have not done that so. Uh, some things that I would advise that uh, to be done are, first of all, do the gap analysis and see what are the differences between ISO uh, 13485 versus the revision from 2016. You will find uh, very helpful information in the practical guide uh, that is published, so I would urge you to purchase that guide and to use it uh, for the gap analysis and when you start revising the procedures. Uh, you will see that the FDA is noticeable, the influence is noticeable throughout the guide and throughout the standard. So if your quality management system already complied with the FDA, most likely you don't have to do any significant changes. However, if you were just complying with ISO 1345-2003, you may have to do some things, including developing additional procedures. So there is a requirement for SOP on usability, requirement for SOP on software validation, so any software that is being used for quality management system or supporting manufacturing has to be validated. And this is a significant task, so if you have not done that validation, you should start doing it immediately. Uh, then there is a requirement for the design transfer procedure. So again, if you don't have that one in place, just start drafting it right away. Uh, when you're looking in the, into the standard, you will see that uh, there is a lot about risk-based approach and you will have to incorporate that one in most of the procedures uh, when you're doing it. And most likely, you might be already doing something like that. For example, for internal audits, you may already base your schedule on the weak areas in the system and maybe auditing more frequently those areas. Now the standard is asking you to actually document that justification. Similarly for management reviews, uh, if you are doing them only on annual basis, you will have to justify why you are not doing it more frequently. And finally, uh, the advice that I have is don't overdo it. Uh, we have done that uh, specifically uh, in the area of the training. Um, we literally interpreted the requirements for evaluation of the effectiveness of the training. We created additional forms, put a lot of red tape, uh, just to realize that we are already doing annual performance of all of the employees, and this is already covered. It was just uh, supposed to be better explained in the procedure. In my job at Starfish, I assist clients with their regulatory needs, and I'm really passionate about regulatory strategy and helping our clients work through their regulatory strategy and work with regulatory agencies on, devi on defining the device development pathway for their devices. Uh, one mechanism that I think is not used um, enough is pre-submission meetings with FDA. Pre-submission meetings are a great way um, to get advice on your development program. And there's uh, a number of reasons why it is a good idea to, to have a pre-submission meeting. Number one, you're establishing a relationship with FDA and with your reviewers team. They start to know you, you start to know them and how they work. And um, it's a great to know, to, to have this knowledge. And 
um, to have a good relationship with your review team. Number two, that's a great opportunity to educate your FDA review team um, about your device and to get, to get them to know your device, how it operates, what the technology is. And when you submit your marketing application, FDA already knows how your device functions and they're not going to ask you all these questions because they already are familiar with your device. Number three, you get free advice from FDA. Pre-submission meetings are free and you can ask um, as many questions, you can have as many pre-submission meetings as you need to, to clarify your development strategy. So use this mechanism. Number four, the pre-submission meetings help you get agreement from the agency on any lengthy and time-consuming studies and expensive studies that you may need to run, like animal testing or clinical studies or biocompatibility, sterilization or shelf life. These are all studies that cost quite a bit of money and take quite a bit of time. If you can get an agreement ahead of time from FDA how to run these studies, then at time of review, they're not going to ask you to repeat any of these studies, and this is um, a great advantage to have. As a recent example, we had a pre-submission meeting with one of our clients with FDA, and um, it was very, very useful because we were planning to do an animal study as part of our validation activities. And FDA told us that we don't need to do an animal study, we can only do bench testing and that's absolutely sufficient to prove substantial equivalence. Not only they answered all of our questions, they actually provided a lot more feedback that we didn't ask for. And this is great advice for our 510K submission that we're preparing at the moment. It was very, very helpful. So I would strongly recommend using the pre-submission mechanism for your device development. While meetings are a great mechanism, I would like to also caution you that um, FDA will not develop your device for you. They will not give uh, device development advice. You need to have very specific questions to the agency in your pre-submission meeting package. Um, also, you need to take into account the time that it takes to submit the package and, and get a meeting date or a feedback. It takes about 90 days, so that has to be um, scheduled in your development program schedule. Um, it does take time, for sure, and effort. As I already mentioned, you can have more than one meeting, so you don't have to limit um, yourself to one meeting because typically in one meeting, the agency can cover about 10 questions not more than that, it's just not feasible. So you might want to strategize and plan to have more than one meeting with FDA. But uh, whichever way you decide to do it, I again strongly recommend have your pre-submission meeting with, with FDA because they're again a great mechanism, they're free, and you get to know the agency, they get to know you, and your marketing approval process will go much more smoothly if you do that. If you want to hear more about the changes in ISO 1345 2016 and lessons learned, please feel free to check my playbook talk.